Good afternoon, everyone. Sort of like to introduce myself. I was asked to do this. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist. I actually finished at the uh, UERM. Um, I did a um, training in uh, oncology. I started out as a medical oncologist. And I went uh, for my radiation in the Clinica Universitaria de Navarra in Spain. And I've been past president of the Philippine Society of Oncology, Philippine Radiation Oncology Society. I'm a board member of the Philippine College of Radiology. And I've been past president of the Southeast Asia Radiation Oncology Group. Okay. Now, our topic, uh, second topic for today is a short, uh, shorter, targeted, and safer touch, hypofractionation, intraoperative radiotherapy, and deep breathing. And um, if you're curious about what uh, this thing is all about, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mylene Torres. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about new advances in radiation oncology and how they may be used in Southeast Asia. Uh, first slide, please. This is not the beginning. Can you put it to the beginning? So I'm Mylan Torres, I'm a professor of radiation oncology. I went to Harvard for college, Stanford for medical school, and MD Anderson for my training. I work now at Emory University. I'm one of the co-leaders of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program. Uh, I was uh, invited here by ASCO to help with the ASCO-sponsored session, and I have a very big interest in global oncology. Most of my research is actually in symptom management, quality of life. Uh, biomarkers and methylation changes associated with toxicities from radiation and chemotherapy. Um, so that is me in a nutshell as we're waiting for the slides to come up. Dr. Yap, who is um, a lecturer in Australia, will be presenting on intermediate risk locally advanced breast cancer. I will be presenting on radiation options for early stage breast cancer. At Emory, I have the opportunity to have a lot of tools in my belt. We have a proton center, we have IORT, we have traditional radiation treatment. Uh, when I trained at MD Anderson, we were one of the first programs to adopt proton treatment, so we've had a lot of experience in those realms. Um, but what I wanted to talk today about was really shorter regimens that can be used pretty readily with linear accelerators that may be in your community. Uh, next slide, please. It's not working. Do you want to give me another? These are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to today's presentation. Next slide, please. So generally, what are the goals of radiation and breast cancer? They're obviously number one, to eradicate cancer and cure the patient while leaving as little trace of our treatment as possible. Increasingly, there's been a greater appreciation for individual patient risk and heterogeneity of tumor biology as we come to know that there are different subtypes of tumors as well as different types within those subtypes. There is a trend in radiation oncology towards fewer days of radiation and smaller targets, specifically with early stage breast cancer. Importantly, before we adopt any new treatment or advance into routine clinical practice, it's important to think about context in which these technologies were developed, the type of patients they were tested on, as well as the treatments that were also available at the time that the radiation was um, seen to be adv advantageous. Next slide, please. So what are we talking about when we talk about early stage breast cancer? 
Namely, there are breast cancers or tumors that are less than five centimeters in size, pathologic T1 or T2 tumors. They don't involve lymph nodes. So when we talk about draining lymphatic chains within breast cancer, we think about the axilla, the level one, two, the infraclav area below the, clavic the clavicle or collarbone, above the collarbone, and then the internal mammary nodes. All of those nodal basins can drain the breast. And what we want to see primarily in patients with early stage breast cancer is that none of those lymph nodes are involved. So even among early stage breast cancer patients, there are those that we know probably are less likely to have a cancer recurrence than others. So who are these favorable early stage breast cancer patients? They are ones that have ER or PR positive tumors that are HER2 negative. They have tumors that are less than three centimeters in size, grade one or two. So when you look under the, the microscope, it's not too aggressive. Uh, they have low key 67, which the session next door is talking about staining for key 67. It's a proliferative marker that tells you whether the cell is actively dividing or not. We also increasingly in the West use genomic assays to determine whether a patient will recur or not. So for example, the oncotype or the mammoprint. And we also want to see that below in a favorable risk breast cancer patient. Inevitably, patients who are postmenopausal when they're diagnosed, they typically do better than those who are premenopausal when they're diagnosed with breast cancer. So in terms of background, when we talk about radiation treatment and advances, hypofractionation has really been the wave. It refers to radiation treatment in which the total dose of radiation is divided into larger doses, usually doses that are at least 2.5 gray per day or per fraction per treatment. Treatment is given once a day or even less often. There's increasing data from the United Kingdom stating that we can even get away with giving it once a week. Hypofractionated radiation is typically given over a shorter period of time, fewer days or weeks than standard radiation therapy, which we used to give even in my training at MD Anderson. It was very routine that we gave patients five to six and a half weeks of radiation with daily doses of 1.8 to two gray a day. Previously, it was thought that larger daily doses were the cause of significant normal tissue toxicity. And now we know that's not always the case. Three seminal trials, two out of the United Kingdom and one out of Canada, all showed that when you give larger doses per day, namely 2.6 gray per day versus the traditional two gray per day, three, works, three weeks versus five weeks of treatment, there actually is no difference in outcomes. There's no higher rates of local recurrence, overall survival is the same, and it just happens to be more convenient for the patient if you can give it over three weeks. In addition, hypofractionation or larger daily doses of 2.6 gray per day is associated with better breast cosmesis. So in cultures where cosmetic outcome of the breast, the way a woman feels about herself is tied to the way her breast looks, this hypofractionated treatment is actually associated with less normal tissue changes, less breast asymmetry, so the breasts look normal when a woman is in her bathing suit, than conventional fractionation where you get treatment at two grade of daily doses. In um, larger daily doses, in fact, were not shown to increase risk for injury to the heart, lung, rib, or nerve injury. And that's something that we were very concerned about when we first adopted these larger doses per day. And it turned out that it, these do doses were safe. So when you look at what patients were enrolled on these clinical trials supporting hypofractionation, they were all low-risk breast cancers primarily. 80% had tumors less than three centimeters, 70% were node negative, 70% had grade one or two tumors, 85% were treated with lumpectomy, 65% did not receive chemotherapy, and 80% received tamoxifen. So in 2018, the American Society of Radiation Oncology issued a guideline for whole breast radiotherapy. In the US, unlike the United Kingdom and perhaps other, um, co other countries like Australia, had adopted hypofractionation pretty easily and readily, but the US physicians were less uh, likely to adopt it. So American Society, of Clinical, American Society of Radiation Oncology issued this guideline issuing a strong recommendation for hypofractionated whole breast radiation regardless of the tumor grade, the side of the breast cancer, right or left, whether a patient had received systemic therapy, the breast size of the patient, it was all what was recommended was this hypofractionated treatment for patients who needed whole breast radiation without regional nodal radiation, primarily those with T1, T2, N0 tumors. So in 2018, the, 
the standard hypofractionated whole breast irradiation was either 40 gray in 15 treatments or 42.6 gray in 16 friction, fractions given daily weekdays only with or without a boost, which is an extra dose to the lumpectomy cavity, primarily given in young patients because they are at higher risk of recurrence. And God forbid that they recur, it's gonna be in the lumpectomy cavity. So we give it a little bit of extra dose to make sure that that doesn't happen. So pushing the envelope further, um, even before 2018, there were many investigators asking, can we further decrease the number of radiation treatments for patients with early stage breast cancer? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I think you skipped a slide. Okay. okay. So uh, within that context, the UK FAST trial was developed. It was a phase three trial, randomized control trial, which provides our best evidence for making any clinical treatment decisions to be used in practice. The trial enrolled patients who were at least 50 years of age, who had tumors less than three centimeters, and who had no negative disease. Very favorable risk breast cancer patients. Regional nodal radiation wasn't allowed. Chemotherapy wasn't allowed. And patients were randomized to what at that time was the standard arm of 50 gray and 25 treatments, so a five-week treatment given daily Monday through Friday, or to one of two arms where treatment was given once a week for a five-week period with larger doses per day a 30 gray arm and a 28.5 gray arm. And at the time when it was de developed, it was a really um, novel and um, idea that people really were cautious about whether this was gonna work or not. Radiobiologically speaking, we've always been taught giving a little dose per day is what we need to do in order to attack the cancer cells and spare the normal tissue. And giving once a week high dose treatment was really counter to that traditional thought process that we had been taught for years based on studies um, in the lab. The primary endpoint of the UK FAST study was really toxicity. Um, primarily two and five year changes in photographic appearance relative to the post-surgery pre-radiation appearance. So if you look on the left hand panel, that column shows a woman who had essentially had no change in her breast following radiation treatment between prior to radiation and after. On the right, the woman has what's called marked change in her breast with significant asymmetry. You'll see her left breast is lifted higher than the right, primarily affecting her quality of life on cosmesis. You can imagine if she goes to a ball or a party and wears a dress, when people might notice this breast asymmetry as she's wearing a bathing suit. It can really impact her quality of life as people might ask her. So they were looking at whether these larger doses of treatment would impact this breast cosmetic outcome as assessed by photographs. Not only was the trial enrolling patients with low risk tumors that are less likely to recur, it also enrolled patients who had very favorable characteristics in terms of cosmetic outcome. If you have a larger breast, you are more likely to have a poorer cosmetic outcome after radiation than someone who has a smaller breast. 80% of patients on this study had small or medium breast size. 73% of patients had a small or medium surgical deficit. So I always tell my residents in training, if a patient comes to us looking poor after surgery, radiation will never help that. It's actually gonna probably just be the same as it was after surgery. So surgery and the surgical deficit that occurs in the breast has the primary driver of cosmetic outcome in a lot of our patients. So a larger surgical scar, a larger defect, the worse the cosmetic outcome. In this study, looking at two and five year changes in photographic appearance, the 30 gray arm where they gave one dose per week for five weeks had significantly worse cosmetic outcomes, significantly worse breast asymmetry. But if you looked at the 28.5 gray, slightly lower dose, same type of treatment, once a week over five weeks, the cosmetic outcome was comparable to the five weeks of daily radiation, indicating that the 28.5 gray might be a good option for patients who have traveled 
travel issues, who don't want to come into the clinic daily, who work, who take care of children, this could be a good option for these women with early stage breast cancer. Um, dovetailing on that, one of the things to recognize is that total dose of radiation is highly correlated with acute toxicities of treatment. So the higher the dose of radiation, the more likely you're going to have sunburn type reactions, breast swelling, more fatigue, rashes, um, the redness of the skin. And that was certainly true in this study where the 50 gray arm had significantly worse burns during and shortly after radiation. However, when you looked at larger doses per day that was involved in the once a week treatment, that tends to be correlated with more late term, long term chronic toxicities, namely breast hardening and breast shrinkage. And that was certainly true with the 30 gray arm in this study. Um, and then if you'll look here, by 10 years, next slide please, by 10 years, uh, what was interesting is not only the 30 gray arm was doing worse than the 50 gray arm, but so was the 28.5 gray arm, showing that perhaps the poor toxicity that we're seeing may not even be recognized until 10 years after the radiation treatment has been complete. Something that we need to keep in mind if we're thinking about long-term survivor and the quality of life of that survivor. In this study, interestingly, only 11 patients out of the over 900 patients, so 11 developed a local regional recurrence, indicating that this treatment once a week was very good at controlling disease within the breast. One of the other outcomes they looked at was hardening of the breast. The 30 gray arm did significantly worse than either of the other arms, the once a week treatment. And again, we saw the same pattern. By year nine, 28.5 looked fine, but by year 10, next slide please, you saw the same thing happening. Year 10 was really sort of a defining moment for that 28.5 gray arm. So in conclusion, regarding this UK FAST study, it, uh, the 28.5 and five fractions given once a week to the whole breast is, a, is an effective option and relatively safe particularly when you think about women who were represented on this trial. Women who were age 50 or greater, had grade one or two hormone receptor positive, node negative tumors that were less than two centimeters in size, and they had to have negative surgical margins and not receive chemotherapy. Importantly, however, it's important to recognize that at 10 years, there is a signal that 28.5 gray and five fractions given once weekly is associated with increased moderate and marked breast shrinkage and hardening. So when I counsel patients about this regimen, I always talk to them about this. And there are many women who say, I don't care, I just want to come in once a week and it's more convenient to me. It doesn't matter that my breast may be harder. Um, I, those days are gone for me anyway. So. Um, at the same time that UK FAST was enrolling patients, the United Kingdom was also conducting the UK FAST Forward trial, which was even pushing the envelope further. This time it was a phase three trial that not only looked at larger doses per day, but larger doses given once a day, five days in a row. So Monday through Friday instead of once a week. And the control arm in this study was the moderate hypofractionation, the 40 gray and 15 fractions or the three week treatment that had been shown with 12 years of follow up to be very good for patients. The experimental arms were 27 gray and five fractions given Monday through Friday in one week or uh, 26 gray and five fractions uh, given in one week Monday through Friday. This study enrolled patients at higher risk for recurrence, younger patients, patients at least 18 years of age or older, tumors that could be five centimeters in size or greater, they could be node positive, they had to have negative surgical margins, and chemotherapy was allowed. Nodal radiotherapy or regional nodal radiation was not allowed in the main study, however, subsequent substudy did allow regional nodal radiation with these really high doses. So one of the reasons we are cautious about these high doses is it can impact the brachial plexus, which innervates our shoulders and our arms and our hand. Larger doses per day can impact those nerves and cause long-term pain in patients, theoretically, but there are studies showing that that concern may be um, an over-concern on our part. So in spite of the entry criteria for this trial being more lenient, allowing more higher risk patients, 85% of patients were 50 years of age or older, 80% were node negative, 70% of tumors were grade one or two, and 80% had invasive ductal carcinoma. The median tumor size was quite small, 1.6 centimeters, and only about a quarter of patients received chemotherapy or a radiation boost. 
So essentially, most of these patients had low risk disease, much like the UK FAST trial. So in this study, with a median follow-up of 71 and a half months, the local recurrence, uh, the lo local recurrence rates were quite low. Two out of 100 women were recurring in any of the arms uh, where the treatment was given, indicating the five-year ipsilateral breast tumor rate um, of 26 gray given in five fractions over one week, Monday through Friday, to the whole breast was non-inferior to the three-week treatment, thereby improving access as well as convenience for patients, particularly um, those who were not concerned about long-term outcomes because this was the five-year data. In terms of toxicities, as I said, the principle of radiation therapy, the larger total dose, you'll get more acute toxicities like burns, swelling of the breast, et cetera, redness of the breast. More acute toxicities were seen in the 40 gray arm, which is the three weeks of treatment versus the 27 gray and the 26 gray arm. In terms of late or long-term toxicities, 27 gray did significantly worse than the 40 gray arm. The 26 gray arm was at least comparable to the 40 gray arm, but as long, and when they looked at patients who had longer follow-up than five years, even those patients who received the 26 gray, the lower dose, were starting to develop more breast induration, more swelling, so also indicating that there's a signal possibly with longer follow-up that things don't manifest in these patients until like at least six, seven, and even 10 years and beyond. So in terms of conclusions, five-year data indicates the 26 gray and five daily fractions given over one week to the whole breast is effective and safe, primarily for these low-risk patients with characteristics very similar to the UK FAST trial. Given data from this study as well as the UK FAST showing that with longer follow-up, you start to see more toxicities with these higher doses per day. Um, long follow-up on the fast-forward trial, since we only have five years of follow-up, will help us provide valuable information on how to counsel patients. Data on the five daily treatments to patients requiring regional nodal radiation has not been published yet, but is forthcoming. Now, interesting, in the United Kingdom, um, as the world has gone through the global pandemic and is still going through it to a certain extent, what was interesting is that use increased of this ultra short fast regimen where you're giving more than five gray per day. Um, it went from 0.2% in April of 2019, prior to the pandemic. And by April of 2020, it was up to 61% of breast cancer patients with early stage breast cancer receiving these larger doses per day. So we'll have more real world data on these patients who received this treatment um, in the years to come, primarily probably out of the United Kingdom. So in terms of conclusions, this is the ultra short whole breast irradiation. Seems reasonable for patients of at least age 50 with T1N0 hormone receptor positive invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, I tend to use the 28.5 gray and five fractions given once a week because there's 10 year data with that. The other one that's given over a one week period, 26 in five days, it has only five years of data. There's a lot of controversy in the United States. I have colleagues who will go ahead and use that, but I personally do not. Um, it's important to recognize to apply these results in real world practice, we need accurate staining for tumor receptors, available endocrine therapy, as well as um, reassurance that patients will actually take the endocrine therapy that we're prescribing because we know that endocrine therapy, systemic therapy, drives the local recurrence risk lower, obviating the need for radiation as much. And I'll show some data on that in a minute. In terms of the toxicity, we talked about the 10-year um, data showing a signal that these larger doses, even at the smaller um, experimental arm, is causing possibly more hardening of the breast, more breast shrinkage. Um, it's interesting that small variances, 30 versus 28.5 gray or 27 versus 26 gray, um, do impact uh, when those long-term toxicities evolve. Therefore, rigorous radiation quality assurance is important to minimize the hot spots and make sure there's uniform dose distribution throughout the breast. At our institution, we used forward-based uh, IMRT, or in other institutions, you inverse planned intensely modulated radiation to promote a more uniform dose distribution, decreasing variances in heterogeneity in the dose, and it also decreases long-term toxicities to the breast. So um, we've discussed uh, 
the options of moderate hypofractionation, whole breast treatment, ultra short hypofraction, uh, breast, whole breast treatment, and now I'm going to turn to partial breast irradiation, accelerate partial breast irradiation in particular. I will also talk about IORT, which is essentially a form of partial breast irradiation. You're treating only the site of the cancer and basically sparing the rest of the uh, breast from radiation treatment. So why do we do this? Uh, the benefits of accelerated partial breast irradiation is that it treats areas of highest risk of recurrence, which is really the lumpectomy cavity. We know that 80 to 90 percent of cancers, if they are to come back within the breast, it will be in the lumpectomy cavity. Um, by giving partial breast irradiation, we spare normal and healthy breast tissue, and we also decrease treatment time, because typically these treatments are given anywhere from 1 to 10 to 15 um, treatments. There are multiple ways to deliver partial breast irradiation. On your left, you see the traditional linear accelerator, so we can give linear accelerator-based external beam radiation, sort of in an IMRT fashion to treat the part of the cavity that had cancer within it. We can also do balloon-based catheters like mammocyte. We can also do the shish kebab technique, which is the interstitial brachytherapy. And in the United States, very few people do this because it takes a lot of skill and practice to get it right. So, um, those are the na namely the three ways that are used, plus we now have IORT, which I'll discuss in a minute. This is a busy slide of multiple studies comparing partial breast irradiation with whole breast treatment, all randomized, level one evidence. Bottom line is that partial breast irradiation for select patients with early stage breast cancer, particularly those that are postmenopausal, 50 years of age or older, that's hormone receptor positive, the outcomes are equivalent. The recurrence risk is the same. The survival rates are the same. What about cosmetic outcome? Essentially, most studies show that partial breast irradiation is associated with at least equivalent to whole breast irradiation, if not better. The one trial that would be an exception would be the RAPID trial out of Canada, where essentially they found that twice a day, partial breast irradiation given over a week period actually had worse cosmetic outcome than whole breast irradiation. Um, and the reasons for this are currently not really well understood. I want to highlight the Florence trial out of Florence, Italy, because it has some of the longest follow-up. It also is a very convenient treatment. It's linear accelerator based with external beam radiation. You give IMRT, accelerate partial breast irradiation that's very conformal and tight to the lumpectomy cavity. You give 30 gray and five fractions every other day. Outcomes are great compared to whole breast irradiation. Um, uh, they're the same as whole breast irradiation with the same rate of local regional recurrence, same survival rates, and have excellent to outstanding cosmetic outcome for the patient. So if I'm going to use accelerated partial breast irradiation, I will often use this regimen. When you look at um, what sorts of patients were enrolled on the trials of accelerated partial breast irradiation, you'll hear the same story. Majority of patients 50 years of old, age or older, tumor size small, node negative, again low risk disease. Same that we saw in the ultra short whole breast irradiation treatment. Astro. Um, the American Society of Radiation Oncology said that suitable candidates for accelerated partial breast irradiation are those with essentially low risk disease. 50 years of age or older, less than two centimeters in size, no lymphovascular space invasion, ER positive, germline BRCA negative, or if you have DCIS, you have to be 50 years of age or older and have low or intermediate DCIS with very widely clear margins of at least three millimeters. The NCCN, or the National Cancer Comprehensive Network Guidelines for um, Accelerated Partial Breast Irradiation in 2022, said that the Florence Regimen, 30 gray and five fractions given every other day with IMRT, is the preferred accelerated partial breast treatment for patients with early stage breast cancer. Turning to IORT, which I mentioned, is a form of partial breast treatment. At Emory, we have photon-based IORT. Emory is where I work. Um, a lot of this uh, was uh, first uh, developed in the United Kingdom um, through a trial known as TARGET. It is a photon-based treatment where you essentially put a point source um, within a spherical applicator that goes within the lumpectomy cavity at the time of surgery. It's very convenient for the patient. 
you have the lumpectomy done, patient is still under anesthesia, you roll the mobile unit over, put the applicator in, you reapproximate the skin around the applicator, and then deliver the treatment. It's 20 gray, typically given at the surface of the applicator, which is at the very edges of the lumpectomy cavity, but then the dose attenuates very quickly so that at one centimeter, the dose drops down to five gray. And this really blows people's mind, I have to say. It's very controversial, or continues to be controversial, I'll say, at least in the United States, because um, radiobiologically, it doesn't make sense. We typically will give higher doses that coat a larger region or area um, after someone has had a lumpectomy, but yet this treatment target is helping, is preventing recurrences at the same rate as whole breast irradiation. And perhaps it's because patients that were selected for this trial had very favorable breast cancers that may not even need radiation treatment. But nevertheless, um, it is a treatment option for patients with early stage breast cancer. Next slide, please. In terms of the latest uh, update for this, the target results, the median follow-up is 8.6 years. There's no signal that target is inferior to whole breast irradiation in terms of local recurrence-free survival or overall survival. Next slide, please. In terms of breast cosmesis, so toxicity assessments, target, because it's treating a smaller area, is associated with better breast cosmesis than whole breast irradiation in this study. IORT, as I mentioned previously, in, at our institution, we do it with photons. There's also a way to deliver it with electrons. In this case, it's a little bit more, um, from what I understand, a little bit more technical on the surgeon's side. They actually have to insert a metal plate that is a lead plate at the chest wall to prevent radiation from getting into the ribs and underneath the ribs into the lung and heart. So that goes in. They have to create a lumpectomy cavity area that's relatively flat because electrons like a flat area for optimal dose distribution. 21 gray is delivered to, through a collimator that's sort of a cone base that's in, placed inside of the breast. Um, and then the treatments can last anywhere from several minutes to a, a few, couple hours. So it really depends um, on how big the area is to be treated and also the source. The Elliott trial used this electron-based uh, IORT uh, treatment uh, to compare it with electron-based IORT versus whole breast treatment. And with long-term follow-up, 12 and a half years, the IORT with electrons was clearly inferior to the whole breast irradiation. So if you look at these curves, in red is the IORT, um, in blue is the whole breast treatment. And you start to see that at year four, on the x-axis, those curves start to split. Ideally, you wanted to see them overlapping one another to show equivalence, but they're not. And so I think what's telling about this study is really the natural history of breast cancer. Um, in patients who do not get optimal radiation treatment, it's not as if the recurrence risk goes away. It just continues to increase year after year after year. So it behooves us to really look and see um, with long-term follow-up, whether the treatments we are administering have durable, long-lasting impact and effect. Because you don't want to come back 10 or 12 years later and someone has developed a recurrence because you treated them not as optimally as you could have um, before. In spite of what I said, the IORT trials did, um, both with the Elliott trial and the Target trial, again, included low-risk patients, older patients, smaller tumors, no negative, grade one, two, hormone receptor positive. When we think about um, the benefits of IORT, um, the benefits of IORT is obviously it's a one-stop shop. Uh, you get your surgery and your radiation at one time, promoting patient convenience. It increases access to breast conserving therapy and patients who live far away from radiation centers or who cannot travel for daily radiation treatment. And that can be understated for women who want to preserve their breast. However, there are limitations and challenges with IRT, and we have to be fair and honest about this. Equipment is expensive. In the US, it's anywhere from one to $3 million for a machine. Obviously, if you're going to invest in that, you need a return on investment. So you need to make sure that you have enough patients with early stage breast cancer who are appropriate candidates for IORT for you to have some return on investment on this uh, one to four, three million that you've already uh, enrolled into for this machine. 
IORT is truly appropriate for a select and limited number of patients. They happen to be those with early stage breast cancer, postmenopausal, negative surgical margin. To that end, when we're selecting patients for IORT at my institution, appropriate pretreatment workup is necessary. You have to have tumor receptor staining. So IORT is not our first choice when we have a patient with triple negative disease or HER2 positive disease, because those patients get neoadjuvant chemo chemotherapy typically. We want to have a high quality mammogram and or breast MRI, ultrasound of the axilla, to really understand and appreciate the full extent of diseases prior to surgery and IORT. We do not want any surprises if we're going to go ahead and put a patient through IORT. Providers and patients are blind to the true and final pathologic diagnosis and cancer stage until after IORT is given. So when a surgeon goes in, removes the cancer, then IORT is given, we don't get the path back until about three to five business days after the IRT has been delivered. So at our institution, we've had surprises, positive margins, positive nodes, um, you know, situations where they're not ideal because then you have to come back and start giving the patient chemotherapy and or adjuvant whole breast irradiation or even regional nodal irradiation. Next slide, okay. So when um, we have to do that, it is sometimes the case that there are surgical or IORT complications that can delay needed and timely delivery of adjuvant treatments like I just mentioned. Chemotherapy, adjuvant whole breast radiation with regional nodes. Um, from a provider standpoint, at our institution, and I'm sure this is true elsewhere, there are opportunity costs for the radiation oncologist due to the time commitment in the operating room to deliver IORT to one patient instead of seeing several consults and administering linic-based external beam radiation to several patients during the same time period. Next slide, please. So um, when we get surprises with IORT, what we know is that if the tumor size is greater than two centimeters, there are four or more positive lymph nodes. The tumor happens to be grade three or poorly differentiated. There's a triple negative tumor. Any of, the, any of these factors roughly doubles the risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence in patients treated with electron IORT. So it's important that we try our best to understand the type of disease a patient has before we dispo them for IORT treatment. Next slide. So in terms of conclusions with partial breast irradiation, it's associated with low rates of lo local recurrence in low risk patients who also may be candidates for no radiation or whole breast ultra sh short fractionation. We'll talk about the observation no radiation uh, trials in a minute. Brachytherapy, APBI, or once daily external beam, partial breast may leave as little trace as possible of radiation treatment and appears to be associated with the best cosmetic outcome. Nevertheless, in the US at least, and I bet this is true in most of the world, whole breast irradiation remains the most commonly used therapy for breast, after breast conserving surgery. Last but not least, we'll talk about omission of radiation for select candidates. So two seminal trials in this area, one is the CLGB9343 that comes out of the United States, the other is Prime2 that comes out of the United Kingdom. This was looking at women who were older, in one trial it was 70 years of age or older, and the other was 65 years of age or older, who had lumpectomy. They had to have hormone receptor positive tumors that were hertinue, actually hertinue was not even identified on the CLGB, but they had to have hormone receptor positive tumors, and essentially they were randomized to hormone therapy and radiation or hormone therapy alone. Both studies showed a statistically significant difference where radiation decreased the local recurrence risk. But if you look at those numbers, the numbers are that if you treat 100 women without radiation, um, 10 of those 100 will recur in the breast. That doesn't seem like a high number. In the other study, uh, in the Prime 2 out of the United Kingdom, if you treat 100 women at five years, four of those women will recur if they don't receive radiation. So it's an opportunity to have an educated discussion with the patient to say, ask them if that risk sounds reasonable to them. If it does not, then you can administer radiation through a number of options. Or you can, if they say the risk is fine, they can go on to get hormone therapy for five years without radiation. Other factors that could help us identify patients at low risk of recurrence besides the ones I mentioned? 
include the Oncotype or 21 gene recurrence sore. Terry Mamunis, who's the head of the Energy Breast uh, Committee, which I'm a part of, did a study looking at NSABP trials and found that a low Oncotype is associated with low risk of local recurrence. A high Oncotype or 21 gene recurrence score is associated with a high risk of recurrence. The Oncotype is something that you send off on a patient's individual tumor, looks at gene expression of 21 genes, and it scores low, intermediate, or high. High score is generally a prognostic factor for a distant metastasis and need for chemotherapy. It also turns out that it's probably prognostic for local recurrence as well. With that in mind, Energy Oncology has designed a phase three randomized trial where patients are entered who have an Oncotype of lower than or equal to 18, which is a low risk group. They are age 50 to 70. They had to have lumpectomy. They're randomized to hormone therapy alone or hormone therapy plus radiation after surgery. And we'll know in these patients if we can stratify based on Oncotype whether a patient needs radiation or not once that's happened. Last but not least, I did want to highlight the Lumina trial, which was presented at the annual ASCO conference in June this year. It came out of Canada with Dr. Whalen. It was a prospective trial omitting radiation following breast conserving surgery and T1N0 luminal A breast cancers. The primary objective was to determine if women with low risk clinical pathologic factors, so those who are 55 years of age or greater, T1N0s, grade ones or twos, luminal A as defined by ER of greater than less, equal to 1% staining, PR greater than 20%, HER2 new negative, and key 67 of less than or equal to 13.25%. They were true breast conserving surgery, endocrine therapy alone for five years without radiation. And um, the acceptable low risk of local recurrence at five years was less than 5%. This is what the study schema looked like. Patients had breast conserving surgery. Key 67 was done centrally, so it was not done on an individual institutional basis. So it was um, very much vetted and quality assured. If the Key 67 was less than 13.25% in the central pathology lab with the staining, patients were allowed to go on the trial. This was the entry criteria, which I just stated, low risk cancers, older women. Um, most, the median age was 67. Most of the tumors were uh, less than one centimeter and endocrine therapy, tamoxifen and AIs were given, mostly AIs due to the age of the patient. In terms of local recurrence, at five years, the local recurrence rate was quite low, 2.3%, not even approaching the 5% cutoff of unacceptability, um, indicating that this approach may be acceptable for women with this specific disease. In terms of uh, overall survival, 97% of patients were alive at five years. Only 10 local recurrences occurred in the entire cohort of about 500 patients. And so in conclusion, this study indicated that patients with low risk disease, luminal A breast cancer, who are 55 years of age or greater may be candidates for no radiation after lumpectomy. Results from the study, however, rely on the availability of accurate pathologic processing for key 67, tumor receptor staining, endocrine therapy, and patient adherence to endocrine therapy. I am eagerly awaiting longer term data before applying it into routine clinical practice. As I showed you those curves that the local recurrence risk continues to increase even up to year 10 and 15 after surgery occurs. And certainly genomic assays may be helpful when we're trying to figure out patients that who can avoid radiation and those who may need radiation. So in terms of take home points from this discussion today, many um, Many post-lumpectomy radiation treatment options, there are many, for women with hormone receptor positive early stage breast cancer. It's important to recognize that robust screening programs are necessary to diagnose women with early stage breast cancer. And to give these women with early stage breast cancer all of these radiation treatment options, you have to have really strong mammographic screening within the country. In our own country, it's very regional. In the northeastern United States, they have very robust screening mammograms. I live in Georgia, and I can tell you a third of my patients are locally advanced breast cancer patients because our government, our statewide government, does not pay for screening for breast cancer. So within a country, you even have heterogeneity in terms of screening. So clearly, radiation one size does not fit all. Radiation recommendations should be dependent on patient tumor and treatment context. 
shared and informed decision making that honors patient values, access to care, and takes into account availability of radiation treatment modalities and proper quality assurance certainly will lead to the best outcomes for our patients. And with that, I'll close and I'll take questions with Dr. Yap when she's done with her presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Torres. That was a very comprehensive explanation of treatment for early breast cancer. Okay. Our next speaker will now uh, be talking mostly on the deep breathing techniques uh, when we deliver radiation. And our uh, next speaker is Dr. Mylene Yap. Thank you for the kind introduction and, and for inviting me to speak. I have no disclosures. So we're changing the scene a bit and, and now looking at um, locally advanced breast cancer and deep inspiration breath hold. So um, we know from the post mastectomy studies that there is not only a local regional benefit but also a survival benefit for patients receiving post mastectomy radiotherapy particularly patients who have T3, T4 tumors and no positive disease. In these studies, radiotherapy was delivered to not only the chest wall, but also the comprehensive regional lymph nodes. In recent years, we've seen the treatment paradigms shifting with more neoadjuvant chemotherapy given, but until we have further um, randomized evidence about you know, uh, radiotherapy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, generally the indications of post mastectomy radiotherapy are still there as per clinical stage, with the exception being some selected uh, patients who have a pathological CR but still awaiting results of current trials. So in the post mastectomy setting, we see you know, a lot of patients who are receiving radiotherapy to regional lymph nodes. And in the breast conserving um, setting, in recent years we've also seen more patients receiving regional lymph node irradiation because of the MA20 study published now seven years ago, which showed that patients in the breast conser conservation setting who have regional lymph nodes added to breast radiotherapy in the N1 and high risk node negative patients derived a disease free survival benefit. And so we've seen patients. Um, recently received more lymph node irradiation even in the breast conserving setting. What's the potential implication of that? Well, when we deliver regional nodal irradiation, particularly to the internal mammary chain, some patients will have uh, you know, quite significant heart doses. Every patient's anatomy is different, so every woman who presents for CT planning will have their heart potentially in a slightly different place and, and a different distance from the chest wall. A patient like this that we see on this um, plan would benefit from deep inspiration breath hold because their heart is very close to the chest wall and you can see that the radiation beams that are coming tangentially from each side are actually overlapping with part of the heart. So deep inspiration breath hold aims to exploit um, the changes in anatomy that happen when we breathe in and when we breathe out. So when we breathe out, our heart moves closer to the breast. And so that is when potentially there can be more radiation dose that can you know, either overlap or scatter to the breast. But when we take a deep breath in, the heart moves down and away from the breast. And that's the anatomical change as we breathe in and out that deep inspiration breath hold aims to exploit. So why do we want to reduce the heart dose? So this study by Darby et al, um, which is now almost 10 years old, used population-based data to estimate the risk of coronary events uh, when we increase the amount of radiation dose that the heart receives. And this study estimated that the risk of major coronary events increases by about 7% per gray of mean radiation to the heart. And also showed that patients who had cardiac risk factors, they start with a already a higher baseline of the risk of cardiac events, but that the increased radiation dose to the heart will increase this chance of a coronary event. But similarly in patients without cardiac risk factors, even though they start at a lower baseline, increased radiation dose can increase their risk of having a coronary event. And the limitations of this study is firstly that this is population-based 
the techniques that were received by these patients for older techniques, often 2D planning, and that when they estimated the dose received by the heart, they actually recreated radiation plans on the CT scan of a woman with normal anatomy. So actually the, the doses weren't according to how those patients were planned, but actually recreated. So some limitations, but you know, at present, this is some of the best data we have. A deep inspiration breath hold technique. Um, this is demonstrated in this CT planning scan here where this patient who's having free breathing, you can see that the radiation beams are overlapping part of the heart. But as this patient takes a very deep breath in, the heart moves down and away from the radiation beam, thereby um, lowering the mean heart dose. So if we have deep inspirational, uh, deep inspiration breath hold um, at our department, which patients should we treat? So firstly, patients with left-sided um, breast cancer, they're the patients going to be at potentially higher risk because the heart, of course, lies towards the left. Patients who have um, the internal mammary chain treated are likely to have a higher cardiac dose. And those that have known cardiac risk factors are already starting with a higher chance of coronary events. So, so these may be patients that, that will be prioritised, particularly in a resource-constrained environment. So when we started treating with DIBH, we only had one ABC machine, and so we had to choose which patients would be um, prioritised. And also during COVID-19 pandemic, we also decreased the number of patients we treated with DIBH, partly because when we treat patients with deep inspiration breath hold, they need twice the amount of time in planning and twice or in, in the CT sim and twice the amount of time on the machine. And when we had reduced staff, we had to prioritise which patients could be treated. And we also had some concerns at that time about potentially some of the COVID risks with the snorkel. Um, so, you know, in that setting, we prioritise younger patients having internal mammary chain treatment, but each department, I think, as they start, will have to decide on which population they will prioritise. It's important to note that not all patients can actually perform DIBH. So at the time of CT SIM, as I mentioned, um, they'll have a longer SIM slot. And so our patients will have an hour booked out. So double the amount of time for a normal SIM. So this has to be, um, I guess, considered for resource constrained departments because patients need to be trained on how to hold their breath for 20 seconds to keep their treatment position for 30 minutes because their treatment time will be twice as long as the radiation beam is only on when they're taking a deep um, inspiration and, and it's not the beam is not on when they're breathing out or breathing normally. They have to be able to follow instructions and follow form a very tight seal around the mouthpiece. So for example, patients with dentures um, with this device at least have some issues with forming a seal and some patients who have anxiety and claustrophobia also find this technique, uh, in, well, they're not able to comply. So in my practice, I'd say at least one in 10 patients that I'm already selecting for DIBH. So patients that I see who have emphysema or who elderly, usually I don't even try them on the, this device. But out of those that I do select, at least one in 10 will not be able to comply. So we're just going to do a, an activity for everyone if they can just hold their breath and we can recreate really what these patients are experiencing and just to get a sense that it's not not all that easy for every patient. So I know that everyone's wearing masks, but if you try to hold your breath and just see what what it's like for the for our patients on these machines. So you can see not all that easy, although I do say to patients not to keep doing that at home before they start because in, with the machine that we use, um, once the patient reaches the threshold to, for deep inspiration, the machine engages and it actually does help the patient hold the breath. Um, and then when the countdown timer reaches zero, the breath hold is automatically terminated by the machine. And patients will be looking at this visual monitor which helps, which aids them to hold the breath. So as they're breathing normally in and out, they then will say that they're ready. Then a deep breath will be taken and the, the patient will see this green bar and try to keep their breath hold within that, that uh, threshold. 
There are other um, devices, and on the Varian machine, this is from a colleague who uses this, um, a marker box is placed on the abdomen with an infrared camera that tracks breathing. Um, so he's kindly shared this breathing, uh, this uh, video which shows the marker as the patient's taking a deep breath in. And then again, the patient will see this and try to aim for their breathing to stay within this, this bar here. So what do we do without um, in departments that don't have breath hold? You know, if you're lucky to have some modulated techniques, that's also a way to get the heart dose down. Um, this is a, a paper by Professor Torres who's just spoken. We don't have protons available in, in Australia, so we don't have the luxury of having this, this uh, you know, advanced technique. But I think in, in departments that don't have breath hold or modulated techniques, you know, what you can do is contour the heart, check the mean dose, assess your beam arrangement. Are there potentially ways to reduce dose to the heart with the beam angles or even look at, you know, an electron photon match field plan, for example. And lastly, you know, we didn't have DIBH, I'd say five or six years ago. And so in some cases, I'd have to weigh up the pros and cons of actually including the internal mammary chain in the volume. And there were some patients where if I felt the benefit was sort of borderline and they had, you know, risk factors for cardiac disease that I might actually omit the internal memory chain from their, their uh, volumes. Look, in the future, this may become potentially less of an issue if NSABP B51 shows us that after a complete response, we may not need to treat the regional nodes, but, you know, this is still awaiting results and, um, you know, experimental. So at present, we're still treating most patients to the regional nodes with locally advanced disease. Um, for anyone who wants to watch a five-minute video about deep inspiration breath hold, this is a video we put together for our patients at our department, and there is a translation in, in Vietnamese and Arabic. Um, just a few slides to finish. I know we're sort of short on time, so I'll just race through this. I just wanted to highlight I'm part of APRASIG that some of you may have worked with, a, a special interest group of our Royal Australian New Zealand College of Radiologists that aims to support radiotherapy professionals within our region, uh, mainly through education and training. I just wanted to share a project which my co-chair Ian Ward is currently leading, which is a virtual tumour board um, as part of the IEAA Regional Cooperative Agreement. And um, this is a monthly tumour board that, you know, all radiation oncology professionals across Asia Pacific are invited to join. Um, they're monthly case discussions with a focus on, on professionals from low resource settings to support other professionals from similar resource settings. And you can see that there's at least one colleague from the Philippines, Dr. Miriam Calaguas, who on, was on this call, um, but there has been a steady increase in the number of attendees and breast cancer is the second most common cancer, which is discussed in these virtual tumour boards. And they don't only discuss radiation oncology, there's also systemic therapy and surgery and, and other issues discussed. So I welcome anyone who wants to join these tumour boards who isn't already to get in contact and lastly, there is another project which we are working towards for 2024-2025, which will be to improve the outcomes of cancer patients in the Asia-Pacific by trying to improve and harmonise the quality of data collection that we all do through our electronic management systems that we use every day when treating patients, ARIA and Mosaic. And so, you know, this aims to overcome the lack of some of the outcome and toxicity data which we have across our region and there's a potential for a project on breast cancer. So please get in contact if you're interested to take part in any of these projects. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge all of my collaborators that, and some who've shared photos and slides and this open for questions if we have time. Thank you. Yeah, for that. Uh excellent lecture also on deep breathing techniques. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. Oh. Uh, for our reactor, I'd like to introduce um, one of my colleagues at the Philippine Radiation Oncology Society. I'd like to introduce Dr. Angela Tagle.
Good afternoon, everyone. So again, thank you, Dr. Um, Torres and uh, Dr. Yap, for those very comprehensive lectures. Um, actually, I cannot think of anything more to add. Um, I actually have more questions than comments right now. But in the interest of time, so um, I would just like to um, tailor my reactions on the three main topics in the lecture title, so which is uh, mainly intraoperative radiation therapy, um, hypofractionation, and uh, the deep inspiration breath hold technique, and how we um, try to give a background on how we utilize that in the local setting. And hopefully, I am speaking also for other um, low to middle income countries. So. Um, and we are fortunate enough that all those technologies are actually available in the country. Um, it's just that the truth is not all patients have access to them. So uh, the main reason being, I think um, only a few private hospitals have acquired um, those technologies. So like for instance, the IORD, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Tanko, I think there's only about, I think one or two institutions in the whole country that offers IORD. So as for um, hypofractionation, so in our institution, we've, uh, we've been offering that for our patients since 2017. So we offer it for our patients who underwent BCS. So, um, but most of our patients still um, undergo mastectomy rather than uh, breast conservation therapy. And so far, we haven't um, tried um, hypofractionation in this group of patients for fear of, um, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, the risk of brachial plexopathy when we try to include the, the supraclavicular um, fossa, for example. And so far, we've only just used the moderately hypofractionated uh, regimen, okay? And then as for the deep inspiration breath hold technique, so again, our institution, fortunately, uh, we have that technology. So we started doing that, I think, about 2019. Uh, we, we also offer it mainly for a left-sided um, breast cancer patients. Um, and so far, we only have about, I think, 20 patients or so who have undergone that um, technique. Um, so it's... Um, so it's obvious that even in an institution who has that technology, not everyone can access because there's an additional um, fee for the use of the, of the machine, which, you know, it's not covered by the national insurance um, policy. So it's mostly out of pocket and uh, many patients really cannot afford it. So um, I think that's, that's it for for my comments, so it, it, that's the most common scenario in our country. These um, technologies are available, but however, again, um, most patients really cannot, do not have access. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting to hear about the local experience. Um, in, in Australia, we also have some limitations with the technologies. Intra-op, I think, is only offered in perhaps two, maybe three departments, but I think like Professor Torres has outlined, those patients who are recruited for intra-op are those very low risk patients who could benefit from having sh short fractionation treatment or you know, potentially moving forward um, you know, the, with a Lumina study, they, they may not really need radiation at all. So in our practice, we, we also have a study called the Expert Study Open, which is very similar to Lumina. And we were recruiting, but recently we've, we've actually had trouble recruiting on that trial because we've moved to five fractions radiotherapy for a lot of these low risk patients who are over 60. We, we, we adopted that during the COVID-19 pandemic after we saw our colleagues from UK and Europe moving forward with that. And so we, we adopted that. And since then we've actually kept going with the five fraction regimen. So um, recruiting patients on the study that randomizes them to no radiotherapy or 16 fractions is a bit of a hard sell when we can offer five fractions for some patients. And then we actually are offering 16, well, our routine now is 16 treatments for patients, not only breast conservation, but also post mastectomy with regional lymph node irradiation. Again, we've followed our European and UK colleagues. Our UK colleagues are now moving forward with five fractions for nodes. So we feel quite confident with the 16 fractions. And, you know, the Regaz study from Canada, which is an old study, and there, there's been other, you know, other groups that have been using hyperfractionated regimens for lymph nodes um, for some time. So we feel confident moving forward with that. 
the only exception is patients who have breast implants and, and immediate reconstructions that we still give the 25 fractions. Uh, thank you very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, in the interest of time, um, I'd like to just make one final comment, uh, especially for the lay audiences. If you notice what we're trying to do in the different specialties, conservative breast management by doing just lumpectomy to preserve the breast, trying to reduce the amount of radiation or the time in radiation therapy from the normal 30, 33 days to 15, 16, and in some special cases, we can even do less, okay? like IORT or the five-day fraction. But the secret for all of this is you have to have early diagnosis. Okay? If this were in advanced cases, we cannot really do the abbreviated or partial breast irradiation or the shorter courses. So I'd like to encourage the lay people to go, the women especially, to go as, as soon as possible when they detect something abnormal in their breasts. So I'd like to thank everyone, our speakers, uh, Dr. Torres, Dr. Yap, and Dr. Tagle. Uh, it's been a very good session. I think we've learned a lot from this. Thank you very much.